All right, welcome back to lesson one, pistol knowledge and safe gun handling. And so our learning objectives for this portion of the course, state the course goal and any special requirements for the lessons. Identify the principal parts of a pistol and the types of pistol actions and demonstrate how they function. State, explain, and apply the rules for safe gun handling. And that's a big one. You want to remember that because you're going to want to put that in your memory, not just for this class. There's no test, as I said, but for the test of life, the rules for safe gun handling, you're going to want to memorize those so that you can be safe and keep anyone else around you safe. Demonstrate how to handle a pistol in a safe manner. Those are the learning objectives of this course. And so uh, we're going to get right into that. Reasons to own a pistol. There are many reasons. Uh, one of them is recreational shooting, as you can see, uh, competitive shooting, um, hunting. Some people actually hunt with pistols, the larger caliber pistols. There are a lot of recreational opportunities in the state of Louisiana for shooting, and then there's a lot of competition shooting also you can do uh, with the ID, IDPA and other organizations like that, the Glock Shooting Sports uh, Foundation and there's other organizations, the NRA, that you can get together and do competitive shooting. Protection of self and family, and that's the one we're here for, is to protect ourselves, and that's what we're going to learn about, <coughs> is safe gun handling for personal protection. This is the training required for the concealed carry permit in the state of Louisiana, and that's why we're here, is for the protection of self. Some people collect guns, too, and so there's many, many other reasons. Exercise of a constitutional right. Uh, some people own guns because they can, and that's okay too. So there are many reasons to own a pistol, and those are some of them. Uh, but we're going to get into the action types now. And so there are semi-automatic pistols, single-action revolvers, and double-action revolvers. And we're going to talk about all three of those. More than likely, not everybody, but about 95% of the people who attend our classes use a semi-automatic pistol. You don't have to. Uh, that just is the bulk of the firearms out on the market today. If you go into the gun store, you'll see 90% to 95% of semi-automatic pistols. Uh, and those are the new polymer striker fire type pistols. And we'll talk about uh, what constitutes, in my opinion anyway, a good concealed carry pistol. But there are single action revolvers and double action revolvers. And it's good to go over those too. Here's why it's good to go over those. You may have your gun, or you may not have your gun, but you may get in a situation out in town or in, a, uh, in another area to where the gun may be given to you or a gun that becomes available to you for a self-defense situation is one of these other guns, a single-action revolver or a double-action revolver. Or what if you're at the house of a friend and you don't have your gun, uh, but there is a single-action or double-action revolver there available for you to defend yourself. you want to know how to use those as well as a semi-automatic pistol. So we're going to look at the main parts of a revolver, and we're going to go through the revolvers, and we're going to go through the semi-automatic. So pay attention to these. All right, we have the frame, which as you can see is the metal portion of this gun that holds the grips and everything else together. And don't worry if you don't know any of these names, you've never even seen a gun before, no big deal. We're going to go over all these so you can know them, uh, and you'll know them well by the time we're done. You have the barrel, that is uh, the actual... Uh, trajectory part that comes uh, out of the front of the gun there where the bullet travels down uh, to finally exit the end of that uh, cylinder down there. That's the barrel end. And then we have the action, which you can see is that lever to the back that that arrow is pointing at, and that is the moving parts of the gun that allow that gun to actually fire, uh, fire that casing in that shell and allow the bullet to go out the barrel, and the frame holds all that together. So, revolver frame components specifically, let's look at the revolver framing components. We have grip panels, uh, and on some revolvers those are wood, and some uh, those are polymer. It just depends on what type you have, and on many of them they're interchangeable. Some have rubber grips on them also, so not just polymer. Uh, but we have the trigger guard also. You can see that is that round-shaped area around the trigger itself. The trigger is the part where your finger squeezes. But that trigger guard does exactly that. It guards that trigger from anything foreign being introduced in that so it does not accidentally discharge or fire on its own. And then you have the rear sight. You can see there's two sight components on most pistols, which is the rear sight and the front sight. We're looking at the rear sight. Uh, and then we're just naming them now. Don't worry, we'll get into depth later, so don't think we're going too fast. And then the back strap. That is the portion 
of the uh, revolver that goes into the back uh, back portion of your hand or into the palm of your hand, the back strap area. And then you have the front strap uh, right where the uh, finger grips go on there. I happen to have a uh, Smith & Wesson uh, blue gun here. And uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, blue guns are what we call inert. They're not real guns. They are just replicas. And so notice I cannot... Uh, Cannot use this gun to hurt you or anybody else, and of course I can't shoot you through the video camera. Uh, but do not practice any of this with a live firearm at home. No, we went over that in the introduction, and I want to uh, go over that again with you now. Do not practice any of this with a live firearm at home or wherever you are. Wait till we get to the range together, and we're in a controlled environment, and you can practice all this uh, in the safety of the range with a controlled environment and an, uh, and an instructor, one of our instructors. So at any rate, we have the back strap, the front strap, uh, which is basically how the gun is gripped. And then uh, we'll look at the parts of the revolver barrel. So next are parts of the barrel, of the revolver barrel. And this is the barrel section here you can see extending out of the frame portion of the gun. This is a very short barreled uh, revolver, by the way. But we have the front sight, which is the fin right here on top most on revolvers are fins some will have a little bit of a uh, not a fin excuse me but a little uh, detachable one but on most revolvers they're fin style front sight just like you see here you can see that as I point that toward you it's just like a little uh, shark fin or something like that and then inside the barrel you have rifling and that's lands and grooves and what that is that is the machine portions on the interior of the barrel and We'll talk about what those things do in a minute. And then you have the chamber, uh, the cylinder with the cartridges, as you know, on a, on a revolver gun. Uh, right here, this cylinder portion, that's what holds the bullets, or it holds the cartridges with the bullets in them. And then we have the muzzle, which is the exit portion, the front portion of this gun where the bullet actually exits the barrel. So rifling is spiraling lands and grooves that engrave the bullet and give it its, give it its spin as it travels through the bore of that pistol. And so uh, the spiraling is engraved into that barrel. And you may have seen the, uh, the police shows where they say, uh, we're going to mash the bullet to the gun. Well, that's how they do that. Each one uses its, has its unique signature uh, that it uh, engraves on that bullet as it travels through that bore or through the barrel of that gun. The lands are the raised portions, as you can see on the screen. And then the grooves are exactly what they're called, the grooves, the uh, recess portions, as you can see. So the double action revolver action parts, let's look at those. The trigger itself, that is what you squeeze with your finger to actually make the gun fire. The hammer, that is what you can uh, cock backwards, and we'll talk about that later. And Or you can release it to uh, take, put it back into a safe mode. Or uh, in a double action mode, when you pull that trigger, it will also... Uh, cock and release the hammer all at one time. The hammer spur is a portion of the gun uh, where your thumb actually lands when you're cocking that back. You've seen in the old western movies uh, that that is the hammer spur portion of the firearm. And then the cylinder. Again, we're just going through the names and the pieces parts so that you can become familiar with them. The cylinder is the thing that spins or the piece or that uh, cylindrical object in the middle there that spins and allows uh, each bullet once, or each cartridge once fired uh, to, again, set the next one up or put it on deck to be fired again. And then the cylinder release latch. You can see with the arrow in there, that allows that cylinder on this double action revolver to swing out to the side to where you can empty the spent cartridges or you can load uh, new cartridges into that firearm. And then you also have the ejector rod that helps uh, remove the spent cartridges by uh, pushing that, it forces those spent cartridges out mechanically so that they will uh, drop to the ground or drop into the bin at the range or uh, wherever you need them to drop. So that is double action revolver action parts. Uh, next, let's look at the single action revolver action parts. Now, this is what's referred to uh, many times as a cowboy gun. And this is a single action revolver. You may have never seen one of these. You may have never fired one. They are fun guns to fire. Uh, you probably don't want to carry one for concealed carry for self-defense. But, as I said, one may become available to you in a, in a self-defense situation in the event that you need to know how to use it. 
uh, it'll be good to understand how to use it. So these are the parts of the single action revolver. That's the trigger, just like the double action revolver. The hammer looks very similar, if not the same, as the double action. The hammer spur, again, that looks the same as that double action revolver. The cylinder looks the same, but it functions differently, and we'll talk about that. And then the ejector rod, that does the same thing as the ejector rod on the double action, helping your uh, spent cartridges get pushed out of that cylinder. And then the loading gate. Now this is different. Instead of the cylinder swinging out on like the double action revolver, this cylinder stays put and it simply rotates and you load one at a time, one bullet at a time or one cartridge at a time. And that loading gate swings out sideways and it exposes uh, that cylinder to where each, uh, each chamber in the cylinder can receive a round. So single and double action revolver. Single action revolver the trigger performs a single action. That's what a single action revolver does. That single action is releasing the hammer. The hammer must be manually cocked for each shot. So in other words, if you look at this airsoft, you've got to cock that hammer on a single action, cock that hammer back on a single action revolver, and then fire. The hammer must be manually cocked for each shot just like this airsoft gun. Again, don't practice any of this with a live gun at home. Double action revolver. The trigger performs two tasks, both cocking and releasing the hammer. Most double action revolvers can also be fired in the single action mode, and that's what I was just doing. This is a double action. It will also cock and release the hammer. And this is the airsoft, but in a real firearm you would see it doing both of those. In other words, when you pull the trigger it would be cocking it back and releasing it. So a double action revolver performs both tasks, hence the name double action. I know that's clear and makes sense to you. Alright, now we're going to move on to the main parts of a semi-automatic pistol. And this is the type of pistol you'll probably be carrying. That's what I carry is a, a modern striker fired semi-automatic pistol. Um, Identical to this training Glock. This is actually a real gun, but you can see it has a yellow training barrel. It's unable to be fired. There's unable, no rounds can be chambered in. This is a pistol I've set up for dry fire practice. It doesn't have a real uh, live magazine, and it doesn't have a live barrel in it, and so the barrel is uh, completely removed from it. And you can do a setup like this too, but it's great for practice. Uh, it allows you to practice shooting that firearm and doing everything basically you can do with the exception of bang at the live fire range. It allows you to get your grip down uh, and get your uh, sighting in. We'll talk about all the fundamentals of pistol shooting and we'll use this, this demonstration gun uh, to do that. And I'll be using this demonstration gun throughout the video to teach you uh, safe gun handling. But anyway, we're going to look at now uh, the main parts of a semi-automatic pistol. And again, this will be more than likely the type of pistol you'll be uh, using. The frame is just like the revolver as you can see. It's the main part of the gun that holds all the pieces parts together. Then you have the barrel uh, which again on this training gun is this uh, yellow protruding uh, part right there and then it would extend all the way into this chamber area here. That is the barrel inside of the slide there. And then you have the action slide and the parts within the frame which is this uh, Slide is the main part here and then there are internal parts that you can't see that are part of the action that make, uh, make the gun uh, move to allow it to send a projectile out the barrel. And then parts of a semi-automatic pistol frame. You have the grip panels, which on most modern striker fire semi-automatic uh, pistols, you, those are built right in into one piece molded polymer or plastic as you can see on this Glock 19. But some of the 1911 and other guns uh, like it, as you can see in the picture, do have grip panels uh, that are not molded into it, but are actually removable, kind of like the revolver panels. The trigger guard, and on this Glock, you can see this is this trigger guard here. It prevents anything from being introduced into the trigger that would inadvertently push that trigger and cause the gun to fire. And you see on the 1911 on the screen, that trigger guard does the same thing. The back strap, which is... Uh, right here in most modern striker fire guns, they come with a removable uh, backstrap pieces that you can, or excuse me, interchangeable backstrap pieces that you can interchange. But it's the back portion of the gun 
that fits nicely into the palm of your hand. The front strap again is here the finger groove portion and on our uh, screen there on that 1911 uh, Smith & Wesson you can see uh, the front portion of the handle of the gun, the part that's going to fit into the finger grooves of your hand. And then the parts of a semi-automatic pistol barrel and I actually have the barrel of this Glock taken out. I don't know how well my camera will show it up but there it is. You can see it. Maybe you can even see down the grooves and the lands like we talked about. But you can see the rifling, uh, the lands and the grooves on this picture, and they're in here also. And then you can see the chamber area of this uh, barrel out of that Glock 19. And the muzzle end is the end down here. And then the locking lugs engage the recesses in the slide. And these, uh, these keep the uh, barrel in the position it needs to be throughout the firing cycle of the gun. And the rifling does the same thing that it does on the revolvers, the different types of revolvers, the single action and double action. The spiraling lands and grooves, they engrave the bullet and give it spin as it travels through that bore once it's fired, as you can see in that picture. Again, you see the lands and the grooves. You may be able to see them again through here. Let me put it all the way up to the camera and see. It may just get crazy fuzzy, but I don't know. But at any rate, let's move on to the semi-automatic pistol action parts. And these will be different from the revolver. You have the trigger, which is the same. It functions the same way. And then you have the hammer. Now, this is a uh, Sig Sauer, uh, let's see, P220 in the picture. And it does have a hammer, but most, most semi-automatic striker fire guns or hammer fire guns have an internal hammer uh, or they have an internal striker, not an exposed one. But there are many guns out there, uh, past and, and present, um, and I'm sure into the future, that will have a hammer. The hammer spur, again, is the thing uh, that your thumb would uh, rest on to actually cock the hammer or draw the hammer back. And then the slide, just like on that Glock I showed you, is that top frame portion and it slides back and forth as that gun is operated that's why hence the name slide and then the slide stop and on this Glock you see the slide stop lever right there and on that SIG it's in basically the same position as on the Glock and then the safety now uh, most many not most semi-automatic striker fired polymer pistols maybe like the one that you own they're gonna have uh, external safeties or internal safeties. You can see in the picture there that there is an external safety switch and this Glock is equipped with internal safeties uh, and a external trigger safety. Uh, this little lever right here if you can see that. And so be aware that there are safeties even on guns that have uh, no external safety there are internal safeties uh, that keep that gun um, from inadvertently being discharged unless the trigger is pulled purposely pulled. Takedown lever you see on that Sig Sauer uh, in the picture that is on the frame there and the takedown levers on this Glock are right here on the frame. There's actually two of them, one on either side. They're identical and we'll show you in the cleaning section how to uh, go about that. Then the magazine uh, and you can see the magazine is what carries uh, the extra uh, rounds or the extra uh, ammunition in your semi-automatic striker fired guns and it drops in or it uh, pushes into the magazine well or the portion on the frame that's called the handle the interior of that is the magazine well and then you have a magazine release button on this Glock that I just showed you that releases that magazine and allows it to drop out to where you can change out magazines if you need or reload that magazine all right Let's get into the functions of a semi-automatic pistol slide. It extracts the fired case from the chamber and it ejects it from the pistol. And so when that gun is fired, this slide goes to the rear. I'm going to keep it to the rear. And as it goes to the rear, the bullet has, is exiting simultaneously out the front and the case which we'll talk about ammunition in a minute so you'll know what these are. The case or the spent brass comes out of the ejection port and it gets ejected and then it simultaneously or automatically if there's extra ammo and it doesn't uh, lock back like that it chambers another round to repeat that process and so the slide 
extracts the fired case from the chamber and it ejects it from the pistol. Pistol. It also cocks the hammer or the firing pin or the striker and that is the mechanism that actually uh, we'll see uh, momentarily punches into the back portion of that casing to allow fire, the firing sequence to begin. Feeding the top cartridge into the magazine in the chamber, I just told, just explained that to you that as that slide goes back and it comes forward, it takes the next cartridge off the top of that magazine and scoops it up into the chamber and uh, positions it into the barrel for firing another round. <clears throat> All right. Let's talk about types of semi-automatic pistol actions. There are single action, which each pull of the trigger performs a single action, releasing the hammer, and the hammer must be manually cocked for the first shot. Or we have traditional double action. The initial long heavy trigger pull both cocks and releases the hammer. Each subsequent shot is fired in the single action mode. And so for the initial shot in a traditional double action, you would pull the trigger, uh, you can have a heavy, heavy trigger pull and it'll cock the hammer and release the hammer and then it'll be a lighter uh, single action trigger pull for each subsequent shot. Or you have double action only where each pull of the trigger both cocks and releases the hammer as with a double action revolver. So just like what we talked about with the double action revolver. And if that is confusing to you, don't worry. Uh, you'll understand more about that as we go through uh, the rest of this information. Alright, now we're going to talk about uh, get into the safety portion of lesson one here and you're gonna hear me address safety often in this course it is our number one concern uh, your safety and our safety and then also the safety of those around you most importantly your family and those you love but also bystanders if you have to use your gun out in town so we're gonna start uh, with the safety rules and you'll want to commit these rules to memory now, you may have heard these safety rules two different ways. There are the NRA rules for safe gun handling, and those are the ones we're going to use in this course. And so, what I want to tell you up front is, if you've learned the four rules of gun safety, and we're going to talk, those out in the, talk about those in a minute, I don't want you to forget those. Those are excellent. But for this course, so we're on the same page, and so when we go to the range to do your practical, uh, we're on the same page. We're going to use these three rules and don't worry when we get to the range these will be reiterated for you. You'll be reminded of them and then we will also enforce them on the range while you're doing that. So we'll help you along the way. Nobody's going to yell and scream at you but we definitely take safety seriously uh, because your safety is on the line, our safety on the line, and then your fellow shooter's safety is on the line also. And we'll go in depth uh, into those uh, specifics later in lesson one. But if you've ever heard of Colonel Jeff Cooper, Colonel Jeff Cooper has Cooper's four rules of safe gun handling or gun safety. In fact, anybody who doesn't know the four rules of gun safety or at least the NRA three rules for gun safety, you have no business touching a firearm. And that's why we're going over them in this online course before we get to the range and you're practical or before you go out and shoot. But you want to remember these for the rest of your life and much less handle a gun, you definitely don't need to tell anybody else how to handle a gun because without these rules of gun safety, it's just an accident or death waiting to happen. So take it very seriously. You cannot take back that bullet once it exits the muzzle. And so we have to be absolutely sure every single time before we pull the trigger that we are following all of the rules for safe gun handling. And so again, the NRA three rules, always keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. Always keep your finger off the trigger until ready to shoot and always keep the gun unloaded until ready to use. Now I want to talk about Colonel Jeff Cooper's four rules of gun safety and they will sound very similar to what we just said about the NRA, but I want you to listen to them. Rule number one, all guns are always loaded. And so that goes along with keep the gun pointed in a safe direction, but it also goes a step further than that that even if you think the gun is pointed in a safe direction, you still need to maintain in your mind that all guns are always loaded. And what that means is if you're always treating a gun, whether someone tells you it's unloaded or whether you think it is unloaded, you're always going to be careful to keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. So all guns are always loaded. The only exception to this occurs when you have a weapon in your hands and you have personally unloaded it for checking. And as soon as you put it down 
rule number one applies again. So once you have personally, and in the military we use two-person safety, and uh, on the range we'll use two-person safety if we're ever going to need to inspect the gun. And what that means is I'm going to visually and physically inspect that gun to make sure it is unloaded. Let me show you how. So I have my Glock 19 training gun. I would drop the magazine out of that gun. That means I have no source for ammunition, but I may still have ammunition uh, that I can't see is there inside the chamber. And so there is a little, uh, the extractor serves also as an indicator on a Glock. It would be popped out. It's not in this case, but I'm not going to take that for granted. I'm still going to keep the gun pointed in a safe direction, which on the range is always down range. And so when we're at the range, we're always going to keep our guns pointed in a safe direction, which is down range together. And you can remember that. Now, if you're out uh, outdoor shooting, whatever your downrange backstop is established, whether that's a berm or whether that is a ballistic uh, foam wall or whatever the case, uh, you're going to want to keep that gun always pointed in a safe direction. Down at the ground also, assuming there's nothing on the ground you want to destroy, and we'll talk about that in a second, down on the ground is also a safe direction. But I'm going to move that slide to the rear. And I'm going to engage that slide stop so that slide is to the rear. Then I'm going to physically inspect to make sure there is no bullet inside the chamber and no casing, no bullet with a casing, and there is no uh, casing inside the end of the barrel. So I can see down in there. Let me show you. So you can see right in there. This is obviously a training barrel, but if it were a regular barrel, you'd be able to see the same thing, that there's nothing in there. Then I'm going to visually and physically inspect that there is no magazine, as you can see there. So I have visually and physically inspected this gun, that it is clear and safe. And so now this is an exception now to uh, that first rule, only that I've done that myself. But on the range and in the military, we did two-person inspection. Things so that I didn't just trust myself to visually and physically inspect it. I handed it uh, to my shooting partner or my neighbor, and they would visually and physically inspect, and they would tell me, yes, the gun is safe and clear. And so we had a two-point inspection, and we'll do that on the range as well, that I will visually and physically inspect your firearm, and you will visually and physically inspect your firearm. So you always treat all guns as if they were always loaded. So all guns, rule number one, are always loaded. And that rule always applies, except for the exception we just talked about. Now, rule number two, never let the muzzle cover anything you are not prepared to destroy. And this goes along with rule number one for the NRA, keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. Well, a safe direction always assumes that we're never going to let this muzzle cover, that means point at, anything we're not prepared to destroy. And so personal property and definitely other people who we do not want to seriously injure or kill. You may not want to destroy that person who is attacking you, but you must be clear in your mind that you're quite ready to do it if you cannot escape the conflict. And that muzzle is covering the target. So to allow a firearm to point at another human being is a deadly threat. And you should always treat it as a deadly threat. It is never a joke. It is never like you see on TV or like you see some very uh, unintelligent people doing, pointing, the, pointing their gun at other people on the range uh, or at uh, home or wherever they're showing off their firearm for whatever dumb reason. Uh, we never, ever, ever point the gun at anything that we're not willing to destroy. So that is rule number two, and it goes along with keeping that gun pointed in a safe direction, which is downrange. And if we are in a deadly threat, we're only pointing it at the threat as much as possible. And we'll get into the ins and outs of that of how you do that if there's bystanders around. So rule number three, keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. Now, rule number two of the NRA says keep your finger off the trigger until ready to shoot. You can see there, and this is the same thing. Keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. This is what we call the golden rule because its violation is responsible for about 80% of firearm disasters that we read about or hear about on the news. Keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on target. So, you don't want to fail at any of these rules. But if you want to stress one of them more than any of the other ones, it's keep your finger off the trigger. Once you put your finger on the trigger, again, this is a training barrel, and this gun has been verified as unloaded, and not only unloaded, it's unable to be used, so it's not even a real gun at this point. But when you put your finger on that trigger, it can go off, especially in a tense situation. So 
what you want to do is make sure you keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on target. And the way we do that is just like you see my finger all the time. Whether I fall down or anything happens to me, or even if I'm under duress until I'm actually ready to shoot and my sights are on target, my finger will stay off of that trigger. It's good to practice that continually, no matter where you're on the range or whether you're loading your gun or unloading your gun for the day. Always keep your finger off the trigger. You know, my daughter, my oldest daughter, she bought a mug from uh, Bass Pro Shop, and it was one of those pistol-shaped coffee mugs. And she loves coffee, and she sits at the breakfast table uh, drinking out of that mug, or she did anyway. Let me tell you what happened. So she would have her finger just like this on the mug, and she would be drinking the coffee because she knew gun safety because Daddy had taught her gun safety. Well, the very first thing kids want to do when they pick up a gun or even adults want to do who have no knowledge and no training of gun safety, they want to put their finger on that trigger. So those mugs, my daughter treated it properly. She doesn't use that mug anymore because it's just a pain to keep holding your finger straight while you're drinking your coffee. But it was good practice for trigger discipline because the whole mug felt like a gun. At any rate, uh, you want to keep your finger off that trigger. So she got rid of that mug uh, because she did not want to be tempted to break that safety rule and then it becomes an unconscious decision that she would put that finger on that mug and then if she picked up a gun in the future she didn't want to have her body uh, and her mind think oh well, this is just the mug again uh, especially in a stressful situation so we want to train our bodies and train our minds constantly to keep our finger off the trigger until we're ready to shoot or as Colonel Jeff Cooper said keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target alright so those are the three rules number four be sure of your target. And the NRA doesn't necessarily address this, but rule number four, it's a good rule. Be sure of your target. You should never shoot at anything until you have positively identified it. And that goes along with keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. Ready to shoot in the NRA rules assumes you understand what the target is and you are ready to shoot at that target. So you never fire at a shadow you don't fire at a sound. You don't fire at a suspected presence. You shoot only when you know absolutely what you are shooting at and what's beyond it. And so we're not just worried about the target, but we are worried what's behind the target because bullets go through things. And so rule number one, to review all of those, all guns are always loaded. Rule number two, Jeff Cooper's rules, never let the muzzle cover anything you are not prepared to destroy. Rule number three, keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. And rule number four, be sure of your target. So if you've learned those four rules of gun safety, whether you're in the military or law enforcement, or you've learned the NRA three rules of gun safety, if you will follow those rules, always keep the gun pointed in a safe direction, keep your finger off the trigger until ready to shoot, and keep the gun unloaded until ready to use, and you will stress trigger discipline, trigger finger discipline, you will not make a mistake and you will not accidentally or unintentionally or negligently, worst of all, discharge this firearm unless it is actually pointed in a safe direction or pointed at a target that you're willing to destroy. Again, if you have any questions about those rules, you can write them down and bring them to me at the range and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions concerning the NRA rules for safe gun handling or Colonel Jeff Cooper's four rules of safe gun handling. But for our class, we're going to use the NRA's three rules. They're easier to commit to memory if you've never memorized them before, and it's just so we're all on the same page. And again, you'll be reminded of those when we get to the range together. So keep those all in mind. Along with our rules of gun safety, I do want to address at this point your safety gear. Now, obviously, you're taking this online course, and so you don't need your safety gear there in your home, and you wouldn't need it in our classroom either. But you are going to need it at the range when you qualify with your gun at the shooting target. So... I want to talk about equipment and was it, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. So you will first of all need some uh, eye protection. And if you wear glasses or uh, if you wear glasses and contacts, I would suggest uh, wearing your contacts if you're comfortable doing that and getting a pair of safety uh, shooting glasses. You can pick those up at Walmart or Academy Sports or any other sporting goods stores or uh, gun stores for that matter. And what constitutes a good pair of safety glasses? Well, you want them to be comfortable, obviously. Uh, stylish, maybe, maybe not, doesn't matter. We don't care what you look like on the range. It's as long as you can see unobstructed, and that's uh, the next thing. You want to put them on before you just buy them. Don't just pick them up in the store. But put them on. Make sure you can see out of them okay. Make sure they fit your face okay. 
so that you are uh, able to shoot. You want them to have a slight curve to them, just like that. You don't want just a flat lens because you want it to wrap around the side of your face so that it protects you. Uh, and these are clear lenses, so you want to keep that in mind too. You may, uh, they have tinted glass or they have clear lenses. If you can get interchangeable ones, that's great. If you can't, I would suggest getting the clear. If there's an overcast day or if it's dark at the range inside, whether we're indoor or outdoor, uh, you'll want to have clear lenses to where uh, you can see accurately and you can see your target accurately. And uh, most all ranges, whether outdoors or indoors, at least all the ones we shoot at, uh, they have an area protecting you from ambient light and protecting you from, uh, from the sunlight so that you won't have a glare or you won't be blinded by the sun when you're shooting. So you want them to be comfortable. You want them to fit your face right. You want them to be safety glasses, protective glasses. Don't just go out and get sunglasses, but actually go in the shooting sports section of the store uh, or the sporting goods store of Walmart uh, or uh, at the gun store and tell them that you want actual uh, safety shooting glasses. So... Let me put those up. And along with safety glasses, you're going to want hearing protection. Now, there are many different choices when it comes to hearing protection. I'm going to show you some of them, and any one of these will be acceptable. But uh, you have to have hearing protection. So uh, and let me address off the bat. Some uh, people have said, well, I wear hearing aids. Can I just take the hearing aids out if I'm legally deaf? If you have irreparable damage to your ears, where you know you're not going to receive any more damage, uh, in other words, you can't be repaired at all, uh, then yes, that is fine. You can do that. However, we recommend everyone wear hearing protection. So the best thing is to wear hearing protection. Take your hearing aids off and still wear hearing protection. Uh, but I understand where some people are coming from, and we've had that happen in a class before. Uh, at any rate, let me grab a couple of these. The standard earmuffs will work, and these simply uh, go over your head just like earmuffs. And they are uh, padded on the inside and then insulated, and so they protect, they protect against the proper decibel level uh, to use. And you, again, you can get these at Walmart or any uh, sporting goods store that sells shooting sports equipment or any of the gun stores. Or you can buy them online, even at Amazon.com. These happen to be Peltor shotgunners, and they're safe uh, for pistol and shotgun uh, charges or uh, decibels that you'd hear from pistol and shotgun shells. Now, there is a different type of earmuff, uh, and I do prefer these. These are made by Impact Sport. These are electronic noise-canceling muffs, and uh, they fit the same way, and they feel the same. Uh, they have an option to where you can keep them off, and you turn on this little dial, and they have uh, microphones on the front. And what happens is you can hear now clearly, or even more clearly uh, with good ones, that, than you could normally hear, uh, and so they work to cancel noise just like this, but they also allow you to hear. And then once a shot goes off, these microphones cancel out uh, the decibel range that would hurt your ear. And so they shut off and then they turn on. They shut off in an instant and turn on. And so they have a super sensitive noise canceling mic feature. Uh, and I like those just so I don't have to take them on and off on the range because um, I'm on the range quite often and I can hear the students and then not have to keep taking my earmuffs on and off. So I do like these. Now, those are more expensive than the regular earmuffs, so unless you're going to be shooting a lot, uh, which if you are carrying concealed, I would suggest you uh, do increase your shooting, uh, increase your practice time at the range. But there are other options, and so you can find uh, little earplugs like these, and these look like they would be designed to go up over your head, but they don't really work that way too well. They kind of feel funny, so I always wear them uh, underneath my chin like this. I think that's the way they're designed to be worn. They don't look like it, but uh, I wear them that way anyway. Uh, so you can get those, again, at Academy, Walmart, or online. A couple bucks for those. Those are going to be least, uh, less expensive than the earmuffs and the electronic earmuffs. And then they have these that are on a lanyard, and these just insert into the ear canal. And you want to make sure, by the way, that you actually insert them into the ear canal. And I've found the easiest way to do that is to wrap my hand around, pull up on the ear, and then insert that down in and make sure it makes a seal in the ear canal, that those baffles actually go down in the ear canal. Don't shove it in there too hard, but you do want it seated in there properly so that it seals off. And you do both of them like that. Uh, you can also wear the little uh, foamies. Those are probably the least expensive one. You can get those for uh, pennies, I guess, or just a couple bucks for a whole pack of them. And you can get these uh, for, again, a couple bucks for several of them. Any one of those are fine. Uh, we're not going to shove paper in our ears. We're not going to shove the actual uh, casing and bullets in our ears. Some people are funny and 
Uh, they can't. You can use those in emergency. They do work to help, uh, but you don't want to. You don't want to do that on the range. So, be prepared with your safety gear. Bring your safety glasses and uh, your hearing protection along with you. If you wear eyeglasses and you know that those are shatterproof lenses, uh, that is fine too. If you wear eyeglasses and you don't have contacts, you bring your eyeglasses. Bring your safety glasses, and we'll figure it out. Uh, on the range if you can see through both or if your glasses are going to be adequate. And so either way, that's not a problem. The point of all this is we want you to be safe and we want to be safe. We want everybody to learn about gun safety. Concealed carry is about saving your life and preventing your life from being taken and keeping, keeping everybody safe around you. And so we need to be safe in the process of doing that also. So hopefully all this made sense. Again, if you have questions about that, feel free. You can shoot us an email or bring them along with you to the range, but make sure you have that safety equipment before we meet together for the second portion of this course. We're going to talk about causes of firearm accidents. And ignorance, a lot of times that word is used in a negative manner, but it simply means a lack of knowledge. You know, you're, you're not knowledgeable about firearms, and so because of your ignorance or another person's ignorance, uh, a firearm accident happens. That's one of the causes of firearm accidents. Ignorance of the rules for safe gun handling or ignorance of the proper and safe way to operate a pistol. Carelessness is another uh, cause of firearm ac accidents. And we know what carelessness means. It means you're, you don't have care. You're not careful. You're not full of care, but you don't have care. Or poor and proper attitude concerning firearms. So failure to apply the rules for safe gun handling, which we're going to learn and commit to memory and failure to observe proper procedures for safely operating a pistol. So, ignorance and carelessness are the two main causes of firearm accidents. And you'll find that's true as you watch the news or you, you hear uh, out in town or you hear uh, through family members and friends, those that have had firearm accidents, hopefully that did not lead to uh, death or serious injury, but you'll find they were either ignorant, they didn't have the knowledge of proper gun safety, or they were careless. They didn't care about it, even though they knew the rules for safe gun handling. So, what are the rules for safe gun handling? Again, commit these to memory. Always keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. And we'll talk about what that means. Always keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. And always keep the gun unloaded until it's ready to use. So let's talk about these individually. Always keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. What constitutes a safe direction? Well, if a gun is in a holster, it is pointed in a safe direction. Why? Because the gun cannot go off if it's in a proper holster. And so if it's encased, so if it's encased in a proper holster, the trigger guard is protected, the trigger is protected, there's no way this gun can go off. You can throw it across the room I wouldn't do that, but you could throw it across the room. You could drop it, and that gun would not go off. It's pointed in a safe direction uh, for all intents and purposes. Now, what do we mean by pointing the gun in a safe direction when it's not in a holster? We mean you don't point your gun at anything you're not willing to destroy. And so you don't point it at another person unless you're intending to shoot that person in a self-defense situation. <clears throat> you do not point it at anything personal property or in any direction of anything that you don't want to destroy. You, uh, so keeping that point in a safe direction when you're at the range is down range. When you're in a defensive situation out in town you're, and you have to utilize your firearm, you're going to keep that pointed in the safest direction possible where it's only pointed at the threat and not pointed at innocent bystanders. And we'll talk about that more in depth as we get into this course. But it also means don't point it uh, necessarily where you may shoot through someone and, and injure an innocent bystander. Always keep your finger off the trigger until ready to shoot. This is safe trigger position as you can see. You're going to keep your finger off the trigger until you're actually ready to shoot. And we'll talk about in more in depth of what that means and when we go through uh, how to handle a gun and, and the actual fundamentals of shooting the gun. And then always keep the gun unloaded until ready to use. Now, some people get confused by that one. What that means is you keep the gun unloaded when it's in storage. When it's on your person and you're in a self-defense situation, you keep that gun loaded on you because it is ready to use for self-defense. It doesn't mean you have to draw the gun, load the gun, and then try to use it to defend yourself. It means you keep it loaded on your person or in your vehicle or on your nightstand when it is ready to use. In other words, that is the gun you have out to use for your personal protection. Now, 
Any other guns that you're not actively using that day for your personal protection, you should keep it unloaded until it's ready uh, to be used for personal protection. Now, safe trigger finger position. Let's talk about that. Look at the diagram here with the pistol pointed in a safe direction. The index finger, that is your pointer finger, should be placed alongside the frame of the pistol, above and away from the trigger guard. And you're going to want to commit that to memory. We're going to look for that on the range, and we're going to make sure uh, that you have a safe trigger uh, finger that's alongside the frame. So commit that to memory. We're going to remind you on the range, uh, and we talk, when we talk before the range, uh, short range portion of this class, following the online portion, um, you're going to want to always, in life and after this class, have a safe trigger finger position. You keep your finger off the trigger, that gun will not go off. All right, so lesson one summary. Congratulations, you've gotten to the end of lesson one. That's not so bad, is it? Gun owner's responsibilities, we talked about that, that we are responsible for everything and anything concerning our own firearms. The reasons to own a pistol, and we talked about many different reasons to own a pistol, including collecting and hunting and all those other things. But the main reason we are here and you're taking this course is for self-defense, for defending yourself or those you love. Pistol action types, we talked about single action and double action. We talked about the main parts of the pistol to include the frame and the grips uh, and the trigger and the trigger guard uh, and the slide and the hammer and the cylinders on the revolvers. We talked about the parts of a revolver. The parts of a semi-automatic pistol, including all those parts we just mentioned. We went over the function of a semi-automatic pistol slide. You'll remember that it not only ejects the spent brass, but it picks the other round up off the magazine to chamber that round. And then we talked about the types of semi-automatic pistol actions, single action and double action. The causes of firearm accidents, we said, were ignorance and carelessness. And you remember... Uh, those are the two main causes of firearm accidents. And then we talked about the rules for safe gun handling. And you'll want to commit those to memory. And let's uh, go back over those real quick. Always keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. Always keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. And always keep the gun unloaded until ready to use. Memorize those. Commit them to memory. Keep your gun pointed in a safe direction. Keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot and keep the gun unloaded until it's ready to use. That is the summary of lesson one. Again, if you have any questions, you want to write those questions down if you haven't been writing them down and bring them with you to the second short portion of this concealed carry course. You're going to want to bring those to the range and uh, either myself or another one of our instructors will answer all the questions that you have. And so congratulations, you have finished lesson one of our concealed carry permit training in the state of Louisiana. You're good for the introduction now in lesson one, and we're going to go on to lesson two. So go ahead, uh, rest, relax, or jump right into lesson two when you're ready, and we'll see you there.